It's been a year since Alice Springs exploded into the politics of this country. I mean, shocking violence there and probably our most famous outback town, especially among young Aborigines, even children. It became such a national scandal that it forced the Prime Minister to fly there for a couple of hours and announce plans to fix it. Well, that violence and the Prime Minister's delayed and brief reaction also helped to kill off his plans for The Voice, an Aboriginal-only advisory parliament, which more and more voters were then seeing as just a talk shop while real problems were out there getting basically no proper attention. Now, like I said, it's a year later, and Matt Cunningham, our Northern Australian correspondent, has gone to Alice to see what's changed since then, and he joins me now. Matt Cunningham, great to see you. Now, listen, one change you've already told us that you have noticed is how many shops now in Alice Springs have heavy-duty security screens over the windows and doors at night. Tell us what's going on. Well, this is something we were starting to see 12 months ago, Andrew, but I can tell you how noticeable it is now uh, in Alice Springs. I mean, I walked down the Todd Mall in the centre of Alice Springs this morning. Uh, it's a place where five years ago it was sort of a bustling tourist hub. There were uh, cafes, there were uh, tourist shops. Uh, now it is just wall-to-wall -wall roller shutters uh, and boarded-up windows. I mean, almost every second business in the Todd Mall uh, appears to be closed uh, and they have this heavy duty security to stop the windows being smashed and where that uh, security uh, is not in place there'll be a window that more than likely is smashed. I mean it, it really uh, was, was something like a ghost town in there this morning. Um, a really depressing scene, I'd have to say, and locals say they're really aghast at the state uh, of the CBD and in particular the Todd Mall. I would say it was in stark contrast, uh, Andrew, to what I'd seen just five or six hours earlier. Last night I went for a, a drive around Alice Springs from about... Um, just before midnight until about 2am with uh, Darren Clark, who runs the Action for Alice uh, Facebook page. Uh, and there were uh, dozens of young children, some probably as young as eight or nine, who were just wandering the streets uh, of the CBD uh, unsupervised. This is not a new thing, uh, but it's certainly not something, uh, that if, it, if we see it as an issue, and, and of course, I think we should see it as an issue. Children that age wandering around unsupervised at that time of night, it's certainly not an issue uh, that's been addressed in the past 12 months. No. Uh, remind us again what the Prime Minister promised a year ago and, and tell us how much of it's worked. I mean, I, I think the, 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 the future of the children for me is always the most important thing. But the issue uh, that he dealt with the most of all was uh, booze, uh, rampant drunkenness. Tell us what he promised and uh, how it's gone. Well, I think he deserves credit for doing something that, you know, should have been as plain as the nose on your face, but the Northern Territory Government hadn't managed to do it, and that was to reinstate uh, the alcohol bans uh, in Aboriginal town camps, not just in Alice Springs, but also in places like Tennant Creek and Catherine and other smaller Indigenous communities. The, the Northern Territory Government uh, in July 2022 had allowed alcohol to return to those places with disastrous consequences. Uh, I think we've seen in the statistics that since those alcohol bans were reinstated after the Prime Minister's visit last January, uh, we saw uh, the number of alcohol fueled uh, hospital presentations, the number uh, of domestic violence, alcohol-related assaults uh, fall again quite significantly. They're still uh, at levels that really uh, represent a, a national crisis, but they're lower than they were uh, 12 months ago. What we haven't seen come down and what we're now seeing increase quite seriously uh, are levels of property crime, Andrew. I was looking at some of the statistics today. Over the, the past seven years, house break-ins in Alice Springs have gone up uh, by 260%. Uh, Commercial break-ins are up by about 160% and, and property damage uh, is up by almost 100% uh, on the levels that we saw here in 2016. So I suppose that explains uh, to a large degree why you're seeing those roller shutters uh, over pretty much every business window in town. Well, there's a real crisis in uh, some Aboriginal communities and Alice Springs is feeling it particularly. But it, it's not just there that's uh, had trouble... Uh, has it mattered? I mean, Queensland has such serious levels of youth crime. In fact, it's just recorded, recorded its worst crime levels in two decades. Now, sure, not all the offenders are Aboriginal by a long shot, but in the first three months of a bail crackdown last year, 111 of the 169 children charged were Indigenous, even though they're in the minority. What lessons can we learn 
from the last year of trying to grapple with these problems? Well, there's no doubt that you're seeing those issues in Queensland as well, in Townsville and Cairns in particular. Um, I think we can learn lessons about really bad government policy, Andrew. I mean, I, I'm not an expert on Queensland, but I can certainly talk you through uh, the policy changes that have been made in the Northern Territory over the past uh, seven years that have been disastrous at many levels. You and I have spoken at great length about the Royal Commission that was held here uh, into youth detention. It had more than 200 recommendations, but some of those recommendations, a lot of those recommendations, made it more difficult for police uh, to, to get young people who were doing the wrong thing uh, off the street to take them into custody. Uh, senior police I've spoken to privately say uh, it really has made their job more difficult. Uh, we saw uh, after COVID-19, we saw the doubling of welfare payments and the allowance of early access to superannuation that uh, in Aboriginal communities in the Northern Territory had a disastrous effect. We know uh, that when they have more money, more, more sit-down money that goes into their bank accounts, the, the results can be quite devastating and we saw that play out. Uh, and then we saw uh, the lifting of those alcohol bans in town camps that I was speaking about previously. I think, you know, there are three things that have contributed uh, to the crisis that people in Alice Springs say is still playing out today and we're also seeing uh, in other parts of the Northern Territory. Look at what's happening in Watt Air at the moment uh, and there are other parts, parts of the Territory, Catherine as well and Tennant Creek, that are really are dealing with some serious issues, particularly when it comes to alcohol abuse and when it comes to crime. And meanwhile, uh, Aboriginal Affairs or Indigenous Australians Minister Linda Burney has been not cited or, or heard from for months now. After the voice, uh, she seems to have gone mute because there's been absolutely no fresh ideas on how to deal with any of this. I thought she should have been sacked over the holidays, get some of the new in, maybe Malandiri McCarthy, someone, but uh, it looks like it's all on autopilot now. Matt Cunningham, thank you so much indeed for your uh, work. Really appreciate it.